Welcome to Tom Goldner, who's a photographic artist working on the edges of documentary photography. And we're going to be talking about narrative and visual storytelling today, uh, looking at Tom's new body of work, um, Do Brumby's Dream in Red. So I'm going to just talk through some ideas about what I mean by narrative elements in visual storytelling. But first, we're just going to play a really short video from Tom's um, exhibition. So before we start talking about the pictures, I just wanted to run through some ideas on narrative in storytelling and what I mean by um, narrative. And this is something that we're condensing into a really short talk, something that Tom and I would probably run over a one or two day workshop. So I'm going to go fast, but hopefully give you an idea of what I mean by narrative. So narrative elements are the components that come together to tell a story. And I like to look at visual storytelling through the prism of film script writing to think about the characters, the sequences, the beats, the symbolism in images and how all of these elements, these narrative elements, come together to tell a story. And when we look at um, Tom's pictures, you'll get an understanding that this is a really complex story. It's a story about the politics of climate change, it's about colonialism, it's about legacy impact. So really big themes. And when you've got big themes like this, you need to think about how do I create a, a narrative, a story that flows, that brings the audience along with me, that enables the audience to start making some decisions and assumptions and interpretations. Um, on their own. So this idea of um, visual cues in um, storytelling, these narrative um, elements. So we're going to go through some of Tom's work, we're going to um, be introduced to the characters, we're going to look at beats, we're going to think about beats um, and transitions. And transitions, when we're thinking about um, still imagery, transitions happen through colour, through tonality, through seasonality. So there's lots of different elements that we think about as visual storytellers that we can, we can bring into the story that moves the story, that builds drama, that builds the um, emotion and then brings the audience to a climax. But whether that climax is an ending, a conclusion or not is, is a question mark. And that's something that Tom is going to talk about a little bit too with this idea of ambiguity in visual storytelling and how we can use those kind of abstract ideas to create um, a more complex narrative. So we'll go to introducing the characters and, and Tom's going to take us through a few pictures that set the scene for this story. So these in terms of photography are establishing shots but these are introducing the characters, introducing the key protagonist and, and Tom will tell us um, who these characters are. Uh, thanks so much, Alison, um, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I just wanted to also acknowledge that um, this project has been really collaborative on so many fronts. So um, we're looking at the photography here today, but um, got a glimpse of the exhibition, which was um, featuring moving image by Angus Scott. We had a um, sound engineer who created this amaz amazing soundscape. Um, and there's been lots of people who collaborated on the photo book as well. 
Um, and yeah, uh, narrative is something that, um, you know, it's such a huge part of photography, of course. And I really love the way that um, we can curate the narrative differently, um, depending from, you know, the exhibition is, um, has been curated very differently than the photo book has, for example. And um, the project, as the name alludes to, it explores um, the idea of the Brumby and the controversy around that. Um, but of course, um, what we're really talking about through this project is humans and the way that we're relating to nature. So um, the photographs are meant to kind of work as a sort of a reflection. So we're able to kind of position ourselves within the scenes that we're looking at. So that's a big long-winded introduction to this first photo, but um, this first image is uh, introducing industry and um, the way humans are using the landscape and the idea of um, domestica domestication uh, versus um, wild and wilderness is something that I'm really interested in. Um, so exploring uh, the human use and value that we, we put on landscapes like this. So introducing some of the, the logging and the forestry which happens. And this is um, the first time a horse uh, gets introduced into the book. And um, yeah, the first image that we see is actually not a Brumby at all. This is, um, yeah, a, a domestic horse. And so again, that I find that balance between what we consider to be wild and what we consider to be um, domestic uh, to be a, a really interesting sort of push and pull. So this first one is, um, yeah, introducing that horse as a character. Um, for, I'm sure everybody here who, um, experienced the, the drought that um, came before the bushfires and just experiencing the country um, the way it was before um, things changed. This is probably a familiar scene in rural Australia and it was really important um, for this project to not just show the manifestation of, the, of climate change and looking at the fires themselves, but really looking at um, the different systems that, that are at play here. and. Um, so this is again like really sort of setting that stage for for the fires that came. Yeah, and um, again this one I think it it illustrates um, drought really beautifully. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about um, symbolism appearing in and out of work, and um, this image is one that I found that um, lots of people look at and bring different meaning to, and. I think that's the, the beautiful thing with photography is the uh, interpretation that happens um, from the viewer. So I've had people who have um, actually sort of felt that they've recognised um, a horse within the the shape of that tree, which I'm you know I love how these extra layers sort of come into it. Again, um, you know, setting the scene for uh, the industry, which became such a huge talking point. And it continues to be such a huge talking point about the debate around um, the climate crisis. Um, and of course, everyone's seeing uh, all the reports that came out after the 2019-2020 the Australian bushfires. Um, forestry had such a, a huge part to play there. So the imagery, um, I think all the, the photos have got this, um, this kind of constant push and pull between life and death. Um, and I think this image kind of represents that that in a, in a way. So um, before the um, coverage of the bushfire started and before the whole tangent of the, the Brumbies and the project moved in that direction, um, Angus and I were actually already making work about climate change and exploring themes of um, the coal mining industry in, in central Queensland. Um, so it was really important with this project to um, bring in elements of that because the catalyst for us going out to um, start making work around the bushfires was uh, all the connections that the public and the media um, and science, the scientists were making between coal mining in these industries and, and how they manifest and um, feed into the bushfires. Again, um, you know, there's, there's been three images now that we've looked at in this, this first section of the book, which are kind of exploring three different parts of um, of the forestry industry in Australia, um, the introduction to the fires within the books uh, within the book was um, one that I wanted to introduce kind of slowly, so people start to get um, signs of it early on, but without seeing that uh, that initial, um, you know, there's not photos of the actual bushfires themselves. So um, the way that that was introduced into the narrative, um, we tried to build up sort of slowly to begin. 
and um, I think this image is one that um, you know it shows the magnitude of it and um, and the scale of well one the industry and also um, what's left behind after the fires pass. So at this point in the story, we've met the key characters. We've met the the um, characters that represent the drought, the mining industry, um, human impact, and of course. Brumbies, and, and this is a way of starting to bring in those bigger themes around ideas of legacy um, and colonialism. So, and this last photograph here is really about setting the tone, this idea that this is a trauma scape, and this is something, um, a theme that recurs throughout the storytelling. So, when I talked earlier about the different narrative elements and, and taking cues from film script writing and this idea of beats. And beats are a way that we can transition, that we can build drama, that we can introduce different ideas into the story. And the next three pictures that we're going to look at are introducing ideas of symbolism. And this is about seating the, the narrative in cultural um, cues that people can relate to. So again goes back to ideas of legacy, of colonialism, of settlers, which comes back to that idea of the influence of humans um, on the environment. So um, a, a great deal of my research um, ended up being looking at, um, well, not just the history of Brumbies, but also the way horses appear um, through mythology, because um, it, it goes obviously so far back. So. Um, this image, which is uh, really one of the first that introduces the Brumbies and um, really uh, the first image that introduces death as well into the series. Um, and I've always just felt it had a very uh, strong tie back to the idea of um, the Pegasus, the flying horse, which of course is this, um, this uh, the ideal of, uh, symbol of, um, of purity and, and um, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I've always felt that the horse sort of has this emotion of almost being mid-flight. And uh, another image which um, I've had the pleasure over the last few weeks of hearing people interpret in different ways. For me, when I uh, looked down and saw this scene, um, I thought it resembled something like a crucifix, um, but obviously with a, a very organic sort of um, matter to it. I had um, someone else interpret this image and sort of describe it almost like it's like an organ which is sort of left on an operating table. Um, so I thought um, that analysis was maybe better than my one, so it's really nice hearing different interpretations. And um, of course, um, on face value, we're looking at um, the scene of a, a house that's been lost, but I really um, see this statue, the chimney almost working like a, a statue or a monument. And I think the, um, the symbolism of the chimney as well is something which is so linked to, uh, to industry and those sorts of things. So lots of different layers that we can sort of move through. So in terms of that idea of, of building drama, so Tom has introduced these symbolic images that help people in terms of their, their connotative reading, their cultural reading, of the images and now the story moves into really um, dramatic moments and it uses colour and sequencing to do that and I said to Tom you know we'll start with that picture of the dead horse and he said to me they're all dead horses Alison <laughs> so this is the first dead horse like the complete dead horse um, that we see in the sequencing yeah and I, you know I think it's um Anybody who looks at this image is going to have a, a really strong reaction, as I did. You know, when I kind of when I came across this scene, and I think the um, the detail of the rear legs being bound is um, is such a, a loaded thing within itself. But we're so um, we're so familiar to that form of the horse being this you know this muscular, strong thing that's moving through the wild, and I just felt um, the form in this picture everything's exaggerated, um, and yeah, as the the narrative moves forward, we're, um, we're hitting heavier notes, essentially, so. And this is, um, this is an image that really set the project off in many ways, and before uh, this project started, I was working predominantly in black and white, so the shift into colour was um, a really, you know, different change, a big change in direction for me, but 
became such an important part of the project as the name suggests. So um, yeah, introducing this section, um, starting to bring in those reds, um, building the, the tension within the, the story as well. It's probably worthwhile saying at this point too that the title of the project, Do Brumby's Dream in Red, is, is an abstraction, isn't it? Because yeah. I didn't know that Tom told me that horses only see in blue and green. Blue and greens, yeah. So this idea of Do Brumby's Dream in Red is, is an invitation to start thinking about climate change, about humans' impact on the environment um, in different ways. Absolutely. And again, um, you know, playing between the, the colours there, um, starting to build intensity in terms of, of the colours and um, also just abstracting some of these scenes, which I think we were presented um, a lot during, um, you know, that bushfire season of seeing so many homes lost. So there's, um, there's links between colour and form between those images. And again, um, this is a, a photo which is... Um, uh, you know, it's it's looking at forestry, but um, it's it's utilising colour. But the thing that um, I love about this image is that we're set, sort of seeing three levels here. Um, we're seeing the the impacts of the fires, fires and the forestry, but we're also um, getting the old growth of the the bushland within that single frame. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's one that I think you can move around the frame in a lot of different ways and take different things. And then we come to what really is a turning point in the story. And the next images, Tom and I have talked about the fact that these images are probably the darkest moment of the story, but they also have different uh, meanings to whoever is looking at them. Yeah, so um, I, I view this um, section always as kind of the, the part that's almost devoid of colour in a way. and. Um, having not gone out there to actually photograph the, the front of the fires. Um, for me, this image is almost like um, thinking about it as the first light after the, the most intense part of the fires has passed. Um, in terms of the, the vehicles and the significance of that, um, you know, people talk about um, the Industrial Revolution being the beginning of climate change and these ideas, and um, horses have kind of predated that, so there's this... Um, kind of conceptual link between vehicles and, and horses in my mind. And yeah, this was the um, photograph that really um, changed the direction of the project in many ways. Um, we uh, were travelling up in the high country and we were making work around environment. We weren't going to photograph Brumbies. I was aware of the situation up there, but um, and we came across this thing. And I made some photos of it and I... Um, I wasn't quite sure how it, it was going to fit into the story, but um, it was a scene that I felt just shouldn't belong. Um, the horses aren't really meant to be in this country. Those conditions that we saw that summer shouldn't really exist either. So um, this was a photograph that, that really changed the direction of the project in many ways. And. Um, a big part of the project as well is trying to, um, you know, explore how ideas like climate change and um, the bushfires or the Brumbies, for example, um, they can't really be contained in these sort of nice, neat boxes, the way that we like to present things. Um, so, of course, like the effects of the fires are um, something which um, continues to impact um, life for a very long time. So. You know, after the fires pass, for example, um, ash clogs up the waterways, um, which has impacts on so many different um, species and creatures and um, the waterways which we rely on as well for life. So um, this image is sort of approaching those ideas in a, in a very quiet way. And um, yeah, this was a scene that I actually nearly didn't take a picture of because I thought it was just almost like too much of a cliche, but I'm glad I, I took the picture. Um, so it's at a um, historical graveyard called Kiandra up in Kosciuszko National Park. And to me, it's just such a strong tie back to um, our colonial history and how those ideas continue to kind of resonate, um, you know, long after um, their past and there's still things that we're kind of dealing with today in many, many ways. Um, and yeah, just, um, I mean, the scene is just so, so grim. Um, 
so for me, this is kind of like the, I guess, the, the lowest point in the entire series. And then once we've, you know, really depressed the audience, yeah. it's time to, you know, shift pace and, and bring in some other ideas of um, renewal, rejuvenation, and I, I don't want to say hope, but I will say hope because I'm an eternal optimist, but bringing in these ideas of things can change. Mm. So yeah, this is um, actually the same uh, horse that was photographed earlier that I was talking about, which really set the project off. And so this was a scene that we continue to visit really over a six month period. And, um, you know, we're seeing change within, um, you know, the horse as it's um, decomposing, but also seeing that, that landscape uh, come alive again in those grasslands. So I think this is a really great example of that, um, you know, that kind of constant push and pull that we see in images um, and that kind of balance of, of life and death, which is happening within that single frame. It's fascinating too, this was the white horse and this was just a matter of months before that horse changed and the landscape changed um, as well. And um, so this is uh, part of the approach to this project is um, creating narrative, um, which is blurring place and time as well. So um, the, the work isn't necessarily presented in a way that's chronological. Um, as we're seeing, like colour ended up becoming such an important um, way to kind of guide the story. Um, and this is an image again from central Queensland, um, which uh, to me is an image which is um, really about hope in many ways. It's these um, freshwater springs that have run for tens of thousands of years, um, right near where the Adani coal mine site is planned. Um, but um, to kind of give a different layer to the project, um, Judith Crispin, who wrote um, a poem for the book, I was showing her this work and um, she works with a lot of chemistry and she was able to identify that um, it looks like there's some copper poisoning, poisoning or pollution um, on that water surface, which is, um, this is a, a location which is meant to be completely um, untouched. So again, it's like, it's those layers and that push and pull that we're seeing. Um, and it might not be, um, you know, it's not like I'm, I'm providing um, mountains of text along with these photographs. So um, someone might look at this picture and um, I'm not expecting them to understand all those different elements, but you can, the interpretation can be there purely on colour or the sequencing alone. But for me, all those little ad additional layers is what makes it fun. So I guess um, if there is an image of um, kind of hope and rejuvenation within the project, this is probably the one. Um, and I can understand why that is the case, because, you know, I mean, this is... Um, the country has adapt, adapted to um, fire in many ways, and we see that evolution happening within the eucalyptus there, growing these amazing blue beards after the fires have passed. Um, but this image was taken in um, February 2020, and we can see, if, you, if we look around the rest of the landscape, we see how choked up, you know, everything still is from the smoke there. So again, it is that, that push and pull that we're seeing there between, I think, the, the life and the death within that landscape. And the Brumbies, again, like time passing. Uh, this is actually a different different horse, but um, I felt that it just, um, it, it was a really great represent representation of, um, you know, time passing during that, re that, that period of that project. And it was really important that we um, kind of achieved a, um, an idea of cycles within this project because um, yes, these bushfires have passed, but um, you know, summers are going to continue to happen and we're going to continue to have bushfires in this country. Um, climate change is worsening. The Brumbies still are existing within this space as well, even though there is this debate around it. So, um, yeah, the idea of um, presenting the work over a period of time was something that was really important to Angus and I. And that brings us to this idea of echoes. So echoes in terms of the narratives that we've seen. So throughout the story, we, we revisit different characters. We know that the protagonists in this story are human beings. It's our impact on the environment. But we are continuing to see the changes in our characters, the changes to the environment that move from drought and the fires to renewal. 
And then there's these ideas of symbolism that we go back to and we have those echoes of the past, so that photograph of the cemetery where we think about, well, I think about, when I look at that, I think about settlers, I think about colonialism, I think about a whole lot of concepts around introducing different species and, of course, the Brumbies came with the settlers. And so Tom's story comes back um, with these narrative uh, echoes. Yeah. So um, again, like that idea of um, time passing is so important. Um, and the final trip that we did up to um, the snowy region to finish the project happened in June um, last year, right between the, the second lockdown. And they're really, um, the narrative that we built before that point, um, it really didn't have an end. And although um, we're gonna be talking about endings very shortly, um, we felt very strongly that there had to be a bit of a shift there in terms of colour as well. So I've always viewed this section as kind of the, the blue section. Um, and this image is really meant to um, speak to the, the image before with the, um, the bones of the Brumby there. And you think about the way that um, two images across two pages can um, kind of mimic each other in terms of shape um, and in terms of form. So. And um, if there is going to be um, one image of the, the Brumbies that is kind of that iconic shot, I think this is, this is kind of it. Um, it's how they're existing up in the snow east, um, whether people like it or not. Um, and there was an element of, um, that despite everything that was lost up in that region and despite all the life that's lost, the debate is still going on about this and the Brumbies are still in that area. So I think, um, what people bring to viewing a photo like this. Some people would, um, would hate an image like this because it might be, um, you know, adding to the, the romance of the Brumbies. Um, but this is the reality of what was there. This wasn't, um, you know, me going out there to find the perfect photo of um, these horses. They're existing there like that. And I think this, this photograph also raises sort of uncomfortable questions for us when we think about you know, humans have a really close relationship with horses. Horses have been part of our evolution, certainly through the, the industrial age in, and, and in colonialism and with settlers and, you know, building homes and, and um, communities in places that in, in rural and regional spaces where um, white settlers didn't uh, exist before. So it becomes a really uncomfortable conversation because mm -hmm. we look at these horses we think, beautiful horses and they're, you know, they're running free and they're running wild, but they're not running wild because they were introduced. So again, it's a reminder for us to um, critically look at these stories. And that's one of the narrative elements in Tom's book is it keeps coming back to asking us to look at these um, questions that make us feel uncomfortable. And then that idea of, are we bringing the uh, audience the viewers to a conclusion. And stories don't need to have a, a definitive ending. They can be open-ended and they can also be ambiguous in their ending. And that's one of the things that Tom and I were talking about is this idea of ambiguity in visual storytelling and how that can open up a whole different way of looking um, at an image. Yeah, I, th I think the ambiguity is such, actually such an important part. and. Um, so often I think, um, yeah, documentary projects especially are presented in a way that's um, trying to present all the answers. Um, but the world is complicated and layered and weird and ambiguous and I think it's really important that um, there's space within these kind of stories to, to speak in that way. Um, so this was an image which was taken, um, yeah, again, sort of um, right towards the end of the project in June um, and a nice little um, sort of layer to it. Um, the image was made quite close to Tom Grogan, which is um, in the Snowies where um, the man from Snowy River is believed to have lived in a bush hut for 30 years, Jack Riley. Um, and I just, I mean, I made this image because I thought it had beautiful colour and form. Um, but later on um, researching, I came to discover that this plant um, is an introduced species, species, which is also running wild in that area. So we see um, all these kind of links back to the the Brumbies and how these are talking about larger issues at play. And um, yeah, this is, this is really the close of the book. And the idea between this image and the image before was, 
I really wanted to take it to a place that almost reduced everything to its most quiet, uh, quiet sort of space. And, you know, there's so much um, discussion and discourse and arguments and disagreements and things that are happening, um, you know, around the Brumbies, around climate change, around these bigger issues. Um, but when we reduce it down to its, you know, simplest form, it's actually, um, it's, it's not more complicated than this, this horse still existing within this space. Um, and in terms of like symbolism, the, um, it's something that both, well, I think Alison sees it as well, but there's a um, sort of a pattern in the horse, which sort of um, kind of mimics this um, kind of graphic that's on the, the cover. That might just be like our imagination a little bit, but um, yeah. And, and then this is the final image, and we both have particular, quite different kind of takes on on this yeah. Um, image. Yeah, and I love again that one of my favourite things is hearing um, how people interpret it differently, and um, you know that's that's a real joy of, of making a project like this to, to hear how people view it differently. So that um, that image actually um, sits on this um, concertina uh, text insert that, um, with Judith's text. So. That, although it's not sitting at the end of the book, it kind of moves around throughout the book however people wish. Um, and for me, this is the image that um, it's, in some ways, it's the close. It's the last um, image in the book because of the colour palette. But we're starting to see the uh, introduction of those warmer colours again. So for me, this is a, a photograph which is talking about cycles. Um, and I, I remember seeing this scene and feeling like it looked almost like a, some kind of stage or it felt like um, something that felt like a, a ceremony in a way. Um, but you've got quite a different interpretation. Well, I was immediately drawn to the sunrise and I was thinking, you know, hope, a new moment, a different way of approaching the environment, of thinking in new ways. And Tom said to me over coffee today, it's the beginning of the next bushfire season. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, these images, you know, they change over time as well. Um, so they mean mean different things over time. And, um, you know, I, I don't think it's all as grim as that. Like, I think that there is still um, still hope, you know, there has to be. Um, but I, I love that you get that out of that image because, I mean, you know, the last thing you want to do is depress someone <laughs> so, you know, so, <laughs> so there's no action. But it's it's really going back to that idea of that push and pull. You know, the, these things are constantly at play. Um, this idea of death, I think, can be, um, you know, it, it can be rethought. It's, um, you know, when the fires go through, it's not as simple as it all being wiped out. Um, you know, getting to see the, the life um, kind of emerge after the fires was something which was um, incredible as well. So um, I like your interpretation, Alison. <laughs> thank you. So thank you. Um, that's it from us, if there's any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the sharing your work, Tom. That's really great. Thank you. Um, also, I was just wondering if, when you mentioned being inspired by film script writing, screenplays, that kind of thing, if you could talk a bit more about um, how you get your ins inspiration from that. Uh, well, I, as a writer, and so I'm a journalist, that's where I've sort of come from, but I've always been really interested in learning how to tell stories. and. It would be probably a decade ago, I did a three-day workshop with um, a scriptwriter from Los Angeles who talked about the importance of narrative and developing characters. And that was something that really impacted the way I write as a journalist, impacts the way that I read photography. And, and for me, it is reading. When I look at images, I am reading images. So I think it's really important when we're when we're visual creators to come at, come at the projects in different ways, to bring in different kind of creative processes. And I think that film script writing is something that, you know, I've written documentary film scripts that it draws on all of the elements that documentary or, or working in the abstract kind of documentary narratives do where you're using research, but you're also um, being inspired by art and 
by history and by other sort of visual um, presentations. And I mean, in terms of drawing narrative from script writing, I mean, as a writer, I'm all about words. And then how do you convey a story in pictures is, is that sort of next step. And that's where I feel that um, script writing principles really help in terms of defining characters, understanding your characters, and understanding the um, way that you can sequence and you can build drama and you can, and, and you can insert pace and you can move stories um, along visually without the need for words. And I mean, you know, I say without the need for words and I'm a writer, that almost kills me. But, you know, there is a way of doing that um, and, and using those sort of kind of script principles. You made that sequencing seem so beautifully seamless and easy and logical and meaningful, but how many variations on that sequencing did you go through and how much time did it take for you to come to this conclusion? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And it was um, from beginning the work in August 2019 to Central Queensland, there was constant pressure every single day in terms of um, making sense of the work, um, under, like understanding the characters within the project. I love um, putting it that way. Um, when, when, when I came back from the first trip from the bushfires, for example, um, and starting to work things um, through with Christian, um, they're trying to separate things into uh, categories and, or characters. To begin with, there was maybe 20 or 30, like it was just, it was out of hand. So it took a really, really long time and so many conversations, um, so many, uh, it was so collaborative in, in that process as well, like through a, a constant dialogue with Angus, um, with the college as well, um, with Heidi Romano who helped me design it as well. Um, so it was um, right up until the book went to print up to the last second. And even um, I got the prototype made through Memento, of course, um, and it went through many changes, even from getting back copies. So every time you print it, I think that you, you know, you, you're able to kind of cut a few more of the, the babies out there and um, just focus it in a bit more. Tom, Alison, thank you very much. Just really enjoyed the presentation. I'm just wondering, if you were doing an exhibition with this work, how much of this narrative or storytelling would you take into the exhibition and what would you leave behind? Um, yeah, great question. And we've just had an exhibition that's actually, um, we've had the last day yesterday, it turns out. Um, but um, yeah, we, we approached it in such a different way um, because, I mean, the book, the book was on presentation at the exhibition, absolutely. And this is, I think, what's kind of left behind after the show finishes in many regards. So there's a certain, um, I think, to try to adapt the narrative that we're seeing to the book to say like the video work or the sound or presented in exactly the same way would be really limiting. Um, so the, um, there's similar themes that are being explored, but for example, the video component, um, which Angus produced, um, features the Brumbies much less than the book does. Um, so there's been a lot of interpretation from all the different artists, artists that have been involved in it. Um, I think that, um, it all works together as a whole and the book speaks to certain parts that the video doesn't. Um, the sound does different things from what the video can do again. So it's a, a constant kind of play between those those different elements. That's um, it. Okay. Final, <laughs> final question. Tom. Are you kicking us out? What's happening? <laughs> I'm about to. Okay. Um, the book's absolutely stunning. Thank Thanks you so much for this presentation. It's great to have all these insights into it. Um, I'm sure many people might be interested. Is the book available to buy? Yes, absolutely. So, <laughs> well, I brought one along. So, if anyone wants to have a look, they can absolutely. Um, but yeah, I've got um, I've got a, a run that's been made, and um, the I'm selling them through my website. So you can. I don't want to give my website a plug. I feel like that's really. Right. Um, but you can Do look it. up look up my name and then put a .com .au at the end of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're there, and we've worked really hard to, to get it to a point where they're where it's a, where it's accessible to people. Because I really want these to end up in people's homes, and for them to look at it over years, and for to mean different things as time passes as well. Thank you. And the best way to support 
photographers who are making photo books is to buy them. So <laughs> do have a look at this afterwards. I also urge you to have a look at the Photo 2021 bookshop that's being run with Perimeter here at CCP. Support photographers who make photo books. Photo 2021's photo book uh, weekend is continuing, uh, generously supported by Memento Pro and the Goethe Institute. Do make sure you see the Australian New Zealand Photo Book Award that is just behind me in the education room. And don't miss the space where there is the Castle Dummy Award presented for the very first time in Australia, um, as well as the um, Asia Pacific Photo Book Archive, both open all weekend. Um, we have David Rosetsky's uh, book launch with his beautiful new M33 book after this. We'll just be clearing the room first. But before we do that, please just join me in a big round of applause for Alison and Tom. <laughs> Thank you.